On May 2nd, VESA announced the introduction of their Adaptive Sync and MediaSync display certifications. I read the usual roundup of tech press coverage, and I think all of it was quite positive. Unlike many industry certifications, which end up either so watered down as to be useless, or are broken up into performance tiers so that literally anything can get a certification, VESA's Adaptive Sync display looked like a real attempt to curtail the monitor industry's fixation on hitting that coveted one millisecond response time marketing bullet point. But here's what a one millisecond response time usually looks like. Yikes. This is from the ASUS VG279QM, a fantastic monitor, one of the best I've tested, but ASUS, of course, has an overdrive mode that allows them to correctly claim that the VG279QM can achieve one millisecond response times. And this is gamma corrected. The response time would be even faster using a 10% to 90% measurement. So I was actually pretty excited when I read all the tech news coverage of VESA's Adaptive Sync CERT, which is unusual for me since I'm now pretty cynical about everything related to LCDs. This press slide in particular. Is it fair to cherry pick the single best result tested at abnormally high temperatures with overdrive levels so high as to make the images horrible? We think no. Right on. But you're now watching a video that has the title, VESA's Adaptive Sync Display Certification is not good enough. So, what went wrong? Let's start by looking at what the Adaptive Sync and Media Sync display certifications require, and then we'll get into how these mandates are tested. At a high level, both certs strive to ensure that Adaptive Sync playback, whether of games or video content, is free from flickering, drop frames, and judder. There is some overlap of their performance mandates, but Media Sync mostly covers a display's ability to play common video frame rates like 23.976, 24, 48, 50, 59.94, without judder or frame drops, and those displays can accomplish that with a relatively narrow VRR window of 48 to 60 hertz. But since you're watching an Aperture Grill video, you're probably, like me, more interested in the Adaptive Sync cert. VESA Adaptive Sync displays must have a minimum Adaptive Sync range of 60 hertz to 144 hertz, which is a 2.4 to 1 ratio. NVIDIA actually uses the same ratio as a requirement for their G-Sync compatible certification. I've seen some comments that were worried about the low end of the range being only 60 Hz rather than 48 or 30 or 1, but that's where the 2.4x ratio comes in. With low frame rate compensation, or LFC, any frame rate below 60 Hz can be doubled or tripled, etc., to fit within the VRR window. For example, if you're playing a game at 48 FPS, the monitor will refresh at 96 Hz. 2.4x may even be a bit generous. I suspect you could get away with 2.2x or even 2.1x, but this is a case where more is always better. Next, let's look at the flicker tests. Of the monitors I've tested, the only one that had any flickering issues was the Lenovo Y27 Q20, which didn't flicker during VRR, but would blank out when the frame rate dropped too low. That's been fixed now, but it was definitely a problem, and it's good to see that VESA is looking seriously into this. When NVIDIA first introduced their G-Sync compatible testing, they claimed that 202 out of the 503 VRR monitors they tested failed due to flickering or blanking. That's a lot. VESA Adaptive Sync displays must pass four dynamically adjusting frame rate tests. The first is a zigzag wave oscillating from the minimum to the maximum frame rate. The second is a sine wave oscillation. The third and fourth seem to be a bit more challenging to pass. Test three is a square wave that instantly jumps from min to max and then falls from max to min. Test four displays a random frame rate every frame. These tests are well designed and thorough, so I have no problem with VESA certification here. If you want to try something similar on your own monitor, Smooth Frog's 3D rotator scene has a sine wave frame rate sweep. If VRR is working properly and your monitor is behaving, the sweep should look judder free as your eye tracks across the scene. At lower frame rates, the motion will be blurrier, but you shouldn't see any hitching, stuttering, or flickering. All right. So far, so good. So why am I claiming that VESA's Adaptive Sync is not good enough? Let's get back to the two response time mandates that I passed over. Mandate one, less than 20% overshoot and less than 15% undershoot. Okay. And mandate two, a five millisecond or lower average of 20 grade to grade response times. These sound fine, right? And they definitely square with VESA's goals from that earlier slide, but VESA is testing too few grade to grade transitions, only 20. Measuring those with 10% to 90% ungamma corrected response times, the undershoot and overshoot percentages they allow are truly bizarre, and overshoot testing is only carried out at the display's maximum refresh rate. <laughs> 
To illustrate why these four things are big problems, I want to try an experiment. The Asus VG27AQ was one of my first proper monitor reviews, and I still have it. It was never a blazing fast panel, and most of today's IPS displays are much, much faster. But I want to see if there's any way I can get it to pass FACE's new Adaptive Sync grade to grade testing. Spoilers for the video, I can't. But the reasons it fails may surprise you. Stay tuned. So let's start with my complaint about VESA only testing 20 grade to grade transitions. For Aperture Grill, I've always used a total of 72, and you'll have seen my data presented in a grade to grade heat map that looks a bit like this. This gives all the transitions to and from RGB 0, 31, 63, 95, 127, 159, 191, 223, and finally 255. Hardware Unboxed uses different RGB values with 110 total transitions. TFT Central measures 30. So, how many do we actually need? I don't think there's a perfect answer, but VESA's 20 is not enough. One happy coincidence, especially for this video, is that VESA's chosen transitions, RGB 0, 63, 127, 191, and 255, happen to be a subset of my transitions, so I can use data I've already captured, say for the VG27AQ, to see what VESA's requirements really mean and how a monitor might pass or fail. And speaking of the VG27AQ, I want to start with how VESA's limited amount of gray patches really saves its bacon from the get-go. In my original review, I noted that the best overdrive setting for high refresh rates was trace-free 80, and that still holds true. So that's the mode we'll be trying to have pass the Adaptive Sync cert. Here's a sequence of three transitions, all starting at RGB 127. The first is from 127 to 191, a VESA transition. This response does overshoot, but only mildly, and it doesn't spend a lot of time beyond RGB 191, all of which is captured with its CAD score, where anything below 40 is really good. This transition would pass every VESA gray to gray and overshoot mandate. But let me now swap between the next two transitions, 127 to 223 and 127 to 255. VESA would only look at the 255 transition, and because this ends in white, there's no real overshoot to worry about. Interestingly, this transition takes 5.8 milliseconds to hit my new plus or minus 3 RGB tolerance, something new I'm trying. But its 10 to 90 time is only 3.9 milliseconds, so this transition would also pass. But let's take a closer look at that 223 transition, the one that VESA doesn't look at. CAD-wise, this response is not much different than the other two, even with the overshoot penalty that I apply. But by VESA's bizarre overshoot and undershoot tolerances, and I will talk about those in a bit, this single transition would cause the monitor to fail Adaptive Sync Cert, if it were part of the test. The VG27AQ and other monitors I've tested have plenty of these in-between transitions that show interesting behavior. Sometimes they're very good, other times not so much. But VESA's limited gray to gray patch set misses them. For any decent certification house, the process for testing gray to gray response times should be mostly automated, so going from 20 patches to 72 shouldn't require a substantial increase in testing time, but it would provide a much more thorough assessment of a monitor's true gray to gray performance. But speaking of gray to gray testing, when I first saw the news about VESA's Adaptive Sync certification, I had this very brief moment of exhilaration and hope that VESA was going to be testing using gamma corrected response times. I posted my why 10% to 90% gray to gray measurements are moderately deceptive video way back in October of 2020. Not a lot of views on that one, but I encourage you to watch it if you haven't. Hardware Unboxed made the switch to gamma corrected response times in February 2021, TFT Central later in that same month. I think it's clear now in the middle of 2022 that using gamma corrected response times is how monitors will be tested by major review outlets. And I had thought that the monitor industry folks would be savvy to this new style of testing. Looking at the list of contributors to the VESA Adaptive Sync Cert, there are a lot of big names. AMD, Apple, Asus, Dell, HP, Intel, LG, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Samsung. My invitation probably got lost in the mail. But these players should know about gamma corrected response times. Surely they've watched a hardware unboxed review in the last year. But yet, and to my great disappointment, VESA is back with more 10% to 90% testing. I don't want to fully rehash my video from 2020 but I do want to quickly cover why 10% to 90% thresholds on linear light measurements are not a good way of characterizing transitions to and from RGB values, which are nonlinear. Here's the linear response data for the VG27AQ rising from RGB223 to 255, a single 32 RGB step with my patches. 
The y-axis was the voltage output for my light probe, but it's been normalized so that the 1 is the maximum sensor read before clipping. Now what about RGB 0 to 31? The same 32 RGB step. Trust me, there's a transition there, but with a linear axis it's almost impossible to make out. At very low brightnesses, small changes in linear light output are easily perceivable as different shades, but at higher brightnesses, those small changes would be completely lost. The difference in linear terms between RGB 0 and 31 is actually less than the difference between RGB 254 and 255. That's where gamma comes in. VESA requires adaptive sync displays to be tested with a gamma of 2.2, and I've got a 2.2 gamma curve plotted here with the help of Desmos. The x-axis is our RGB values from 0 to 255, and the y-axis represents the same normalized linear light response. Let's start by looking at that transition from 223 to 255. If I added these purple lines that represent 10% to 90% of the total linear transition, we can see what RGB values those 10% and 90% lines correspond with. And here, the 223 to 255 transition is really from RGB 226 to 252. That's a relatively strict 3 RGB tolerance on both ends. But this is not a transition that VESA requires, so let's drop the low RGB value down to RGB 127. Notice a few things here. 1. Even though the high-end target is still RGB 255, as the transition gets wider, the tolerance on the top end also increases. We're now at a 9 RGB tolerance. That's one problem with using percentages. And 2. The tolerance on the lower end is changing much more rapidly than on the top end. This is the real problem. At even this moderate gray level, the low end tolerance is now 19 RGB values, which is easily visibly distinguishable from the target color. And this disparity will keep getting worse as the transition width increases. Let's drop the low end down to RGB 63. The 10% linear value is now more than 40 RGB values away from where it purportedly measures. And finally, from white to black, that 10% value never goes below RGB 90. So when VESA is testing response times, their black to white transition is really measuring how long it takes for the panel to go from RGB 90 to RGB 243. A full 40% of this transition, in RGB terms, is tossed away. I called this moderately deceptive in my original video because the badness depends on the transition, where you are on the gamma curve. Here's a chart that shows what each to from value is actually measuring when using 10% to 90% linear measurements. But it may be easier to see which transitions are most affected with a chart that shows how much of the RGB range is thrown away when using non-gamma corrected 10% to 90% values. Here we can see that any of the transitions that begin or end with zero toss 40% of the RGB range. Others are better, but we're looking at a minimum of 20% loss. Why in particular is this a problem? Well, let's get back to trying to get the VG27AQ to pass VESA's new CERT. Here's the ACES, still with Trace Free 80, falling from white to black, and what I'm showing now is a proper gamma-corrected RGB response. This is pretty terrible. I've got the full transition taking 17 milliseconds, but because it spends so much time away from black, the CAD score just keeps accumulating, leading to a very bad CAD of 109. You can probably see where I'm going with this, but let's look at the same transition with a linear scale. The 90% and 10% levels are marked in purple just as before, and I've got the 90-10 time for this transition at only 5.7 milliseconds. This of course doesn't quite pass VESA's 5 millisecond cutoff, but it nearly does, and that's pretty alarming. So white to black doesn't quite hit the VESA 5 millisecond cutoff. What about the other 19 transitions? Here's the full chart for the VG27AQ. And the average for all 20? 5.5 milliseconds. So yes, the VG27AQ with Trace Free 80 would fail the test, but not by much. And given how poorly the VG27AQ compares with more modern IPS displays, VESA's 5 millisecond gray to gray isn't really the seal of quality you'd expect. But the VG27AQ doesn't just fail based on response times, it would also fail VESA's overshoot mandates. Earlier, I joked that VESA hadn't seen my gray to gray video but their choice to use different allowable overshoot and undershoot percentages, 20 and 15 respectively, is a tacit acknowledgement that they do understand the concept of gamma correction. For brighter transitions, large differences in linear measurements don't correspond to large RGB differences, so VESA allows a looser 20% overshoot.
At the low end, where linear measurements have a larger overall effect on RGB differences, they require a tighter 15% undershoot limit. That sounds reasonable at first, but let me see if I can demonstrate why I call those truly bizarre. Out of Vesa's 20 greater grade transitions, only these 12 have a real potential to overshoot or undershoot. The transitions that end in 255 could overshoot, but it's rare, and generally they don't overshoot by significant amounts. Manufacturers could artificially lower their white level to allow room to overshoot white, but that would come at a contrast penalty. So let's just look at these 12 transitions. We know that the rising transitions can overshoot by 20%, and the falling transitions only by 15%, but since I'm all about gamma correction, what I'd really like to know is how many RGB values those percentages correspond with. To find out, let's go back to that Desmos graph. I want to start with a transition from RGB 127 to 191, or the other way around if we're falling. And I'm going to add in red lines that indicate on the linear axis where a 20% overshoot and 15% undershoot would lie. And then we can trace those down to the x-axis to find what they would mean in RGB terms. These are, of course, assuming a perfect 2.2 gamma, which is not achievable with real monitors. So real measurements will be a little bit different. At the top end, a transition that is supposed to end at RGB 191 is allowed by VESA to overshoot by 10 RGB values up to 201. That's actually a nice cutoff. I found that overshooting or undershooting less than 10 RGB gets lost in the general sample and hold blur of LCD monitors, but anything higher starts to become visibly distracting as inverse ghosting. But at the low end, even with a tighter 15% margin, the lowest allowable undershoot is to RGB 114, a tolerance of 13. But what happens if I drop the low end down to RGB 63? Notice that that same 15% undershoot is rapidly running away from the low target. And by RGB 75, a 15% undershoot in linear terms has actually gone negative in RGB terms. What this means is that for transitions from white or 191 down to RGB 63, manufacturers could set the monitor to undershoot massively all the way to black even, and that would still be perfectly acceptable according to VESA's percentage tolerances. These transitions can't fail no matter how much they undershoot. Baffling. Let me show a real example of a terrible transition that would pass VESA's undershoot test. Here's the Lenovo Y27Q20 with overdrive set to extreme. Extreme wasn't the out-of-box configuration, it was the one millisecond marketing configuration, but it does show a great example of what would be allowed by VESA's bonkers undershoot criteria. This RGB 191 to 63 falling transition undershoots all the way down to RGB 12, and its CAD is a ridiculous 103. And yet, for VESA, no problem. You probably don't believe me, so let's look at the linear data. This transition's very lowest point is only a 9.5% undershoot, well below the 15% tolerance. Now, because real monitors don't adhere perfectly to 2.2 gamma, you can't actually have a monitor driven to black past this test, but you can get pretty close. Let's go back to the greater gray chart and fill in the allowable RGB overshoot and undershoot values based on a 2.2 gamma. Both 191 and 255 to RGB 63 show that crazy 63 RGB tolerance. But there are other falling transitions that are incredibly lax as well. 255 to 127 allows an undershoot of 38 RGB values, and 127 to 63 allows a tolerance of 19. And for rising transitions, there's a strange spread from 5 to 17. Why are these all so different? sRGB, or gamma 2.2, is roughly perceptually uniform, so a 5 RGB difference looks like a 5 RGB difference whether at the low end or the high end. It would make so much more sense to gamma correct these responses and then choose a fixed RGB tolerance at both ends for overshoot and undershoot. Simon over at TFT Central has come closest, I think, to creating sensical measurement parameters, so I encourage you to read his response time testing article. Or everyone could just use cumulative absolute deviation. VESA at least made an attempt to control further problems with linear response time data by using different percentages for overshoot and undershoot. But because they didn't fully commit to using gamma corrected responses and ditching percentages altogether, they ended up with a confusing and bizarre mix of testing criteria. Now, I haven't talked much about VESA's laxer 20% overshoot mandate, but as you probably guessed, I'm not happy with that either, but for a slightly different reason. I started this video off by showing a response from the VG279QM, which was a clear case where overdrive was far too excessive.
Vesa has the right goal in mind, trying to limit nonsense like this, but overshoot percentages are just not the way to make that happen. Let's switch back to the VG27AQ to see why. I teased earlier that its average greater gray response time of 5.5 milliseconds wasn't the only reason it would fail Vesa's cert. It also fails because two of its 20 response times have excessive overshoot. Let's take a look. Here's RGB 0 to 191. This transition alone would cause the VG27AQ to fail, which blows my mind. Even compared with more modern panels, this is a great transition. Overdrive here is used perfectly to slightly goose the transition without taking it too far, and the CAD score of 33 bears this out. But that little blip at the top, in linear terms, is too much. Again, you may not believe me, so let's look at the linear response. Oh. That's what 24% overshoot looks like. But come on, it makes zero sense to fail a monitor for a transition like this. Here's another transition that causes the VG27AQ to fail. RGB 127 to 191. Another 24% linear overshoot. And this one's even better than the last. Look at that CAD score. I think you can see now why I'm not a fan of VESA's grade to grade testing. But I do want to harp on one more thing. Sorry, VESA. And that's that VESA is only applying their grade to grade mandates at the display's maximum refresh rate. Even if their testing were good, which it's not, only testing at the max refresh rate of a display misses a huge swath of a display's performance in what we care about here, the display's adaptive sync range. That's even in the name of VESA's certification. Puzzlingly, VESA put this statement on their adaptive sync fact page. For the grade to grade undershoot overshoot tests, are you testing at one refresh rate or multiple refresh rates? And their answer? When running in adaptive sync mode, the refresh rate and the speed at which the display scan out is occurring is always at maximum refresh rate. When frames are being updated at less than the maximum refresh rate of the panel, this is not because the panel is running any slower, but because the vertical blanking interval timing between frame to frame has increased. Okay, that is true. They go on. Therefore, there is no reason to test gray to gray overshoot undershoot at anything other than maximum refresh rate, as that's the only rate the panel will be operating at when in adaptive sync mode. What? No. A does not imply B. There's a reason why reviewers test response times throughout a monitor's adaptive sync range, and that's the same reason why NVIDIA advertises their G-Sync displays as having variable overdrive. Most displays do not behave the same at the low end of their adaptive sync range as they do at the top end, and in fact, most perform worse. That's why we test. Here's an example. This is the VG279QM at 279 FPS in its adaptive sync range with overdrive set to 100, and we're going from RGB 0 to 191. This response overshoots way past the target, up to RGB 240, but notice where and when it turns around back to the target of 191. That happens at 3.6 milliseconds, or interestingly, one frame at 280 FPS. Next, let's look at the exact same situation, but when the frame rate drops down to 85 FPS, an 11.8 millisecond frame. Whoa, this is way worse. Not only does it overshoot to a higher RGB value, essentially all the way to white, the panel stays there until a full 85 FPS frame has been drawn, only then returning back towards the target. The good question is, why is this happening? Or maybe better, are these two transitions actually different? It may surprise you that they're really the same transition, except that at 280 FPS, the overshoot was interrupted before it had a chance to reach all the way to white. If I overlay these two, they're the same transition. Monitors use a lookup table for each of their overdrive modes to specify how far to overdrive given any particular to from transition. In this case with the VG279QM, it knows that for a 0 to 191 transition with overdrive 100, it should actually target RGB255 for the first frame. At high refresh rates, manufacturers can get away with higher overdrive because that overshoot will be interrupted fairly quickly, but that's not the case as the frame rate drops, where that overshoot will linger on the screen for longer and longer durations, consequently getting more and more visually distracting. Reviewers have to measure this, and it's an important aspect of the display's performance. I have no idea how this answer ended up being part of VESA's Adaptive Sync FAQ. What's even more confusing is that NVIDIA is listed as one of the contributors to the certification. I'm surprised they let this one get past. VESA is just wrong here. All right, that's about all I've got to say on VESA's Adaptive Sync certification. As I mentioned earlier, I was actually excited hearing about Adaptive Sync display, 
so I don't love making videos like this. I would much rather be impressed and amazed by a certification that could put a stop to the monitor marketing nonsense and would actually have the teeth to ensure that monitors that passed would offer not just a good, but a great experience when gaming at any frame rate. But I don't think Adaptive Sync is that. Not all of the serve is bad, of course. I do like the flicker testing, but I'm not sure who's shipping monitors that flicker during VRR in 2022. But the greater gray testing is just so weird. If I were working at one of these display manufacturers, I don't think I'd even try to pass the cert. The overshoot percentages would be unnecessarily limiting. I think you could do a better job without adaptive sync display. That's all for this one. Thanks for watching.